Welcome, everybody, to the first of the series of digital events that are happening throughout the year. Uh, this is the Digi Ed 18, following from the November 7th event that we did, uh, where there was quite a lot of uh, different puzzles about different activities and practice being shared across. The whole point of this is to highlight key people like Jasper across the university to sort of share their practice and actually give you something which you can then take away and try in your own practice. It's all about CPD and development. Uh, we do actually have six more coming up. Uh, some of them are maker spaces, so you can then take resources actually away with you from that session to use. And then we've got presentation demonstrations like what Jasper's going to be doing today. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll hand you over to Jasper to uh, tell you the rest. Okay, right, well it's great to see you all. Um, I'm Jasper from the School of Healthy Social Care. I've met a number of you before and some of you I haven't. Um, and I've asked Amy as something to join us from the Student Union because we've actually been working a lot together, collaborating a lot together. So what I'm actually going to do is change the order around and Amy, do you want to come up at the yeah, front I'll see, with me? Yeah. Um, because I've asked Amy to talk about um, one of the projects we've been working together on, which really helped, has been helping me to understand more about the student digital experience, which is the student consultants project. Previously, some of you might know a student consultants on teaching. Uh, but I, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, if that's right, Amy, around... Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> around the collaboration. <laughs> So we've decided to work together, haven't yes, we, on yeah. the project, yeah. um, and you're running into it. Do you want to say a little bit about the, the project, what it does first? Yeah, so um, obviously we, um, from the SU, we run it from, um, from the student's perspective, so um, we gain um, students who want to get a bit more involved with academic opportunities, get a bit more involved with the, from, with, with the university. Um, we've worked in partnership with um, careers and employability, so all of the volunteering hours that they do as part of student consultants also go towards Lincoln Awards, which is another great incentive for them to get involved. Um, we basically we've cr um, created some online training for students to do in regards to getting involved. So with um, there's some facilitation training in there as well. From what we found um, from previous. I don't want to mention it as Scots, but it was previously called Scots, wasn't it? Um, but we've sort of just taken that acronym away now and um, just kept it as student consultants. So obviously we, we try to move it away as not necessarily just consulting on teaching, but consulting on all aspects of the university. So whether that be, um, for example, if you wanted to create some more training or um, any more activities within within your practice, we can you can actually ask for a student to come and consult on that and just give their impartial view, because ultimately, it, possibly maybe students who are wanting to engage with that, therefore getting their feedback is actually really quite important, having their voice heard on that. So for example, we've had um, David Pritchard from the Lincoln Academy of Learning and Teaching. He delivered some Photoshop training and then he had two of his consultants come and actually take part in that training and give their impartial feedback on that. Then hopefully then he can then take that student voice on board and deliver that further into more students across the university. Just a little bit of an example there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be I know it can sound a little bit daunting in regards to having a consultant and, le and coming into lectures and things like that. So we, we try to make it a bit more of a wider prospect rather than just on teaching. Rather, so other aspects of it, whether it be training, um, online, um, digital, so um, all different aspects of that. Because we don't we want to be too necessarily. Because obviously we want to engage as many staff as possible to have um, a con you know take part in the consultancy. Because from our perspective, we've re we have trained up those students, so we're just asking from a staff perspective now whether you'd like some impartial um, feedback on any aspects of your learning or teaching that we, we can actually supply those consultants for you. I feel like I've absolutely just <laughs> wear vomiting, so I'm very <laughs> sorry. Was, was, is that sort of, that's, has that even answered great. your so question, Jess? I'm very sorry about so that. So student digital experience is something. I've worked with student consultants to look at the flipped classroom and work with students around the design of the online environment around the classroom and then brought the students into the classroom to demonstrate digital tools and approaches and taken that to this conference a couple of years ago with students. Um, I've done many more projects since then so it is a really powerful. We've flipped the training yeah. for student engagement as well. That's been another sort of adaptation. Yeah. Of the approach, are we going to do a conference paper together soon? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's student yeah, engagement yeah. partnership. Yes. So, so, one last question then around in terms of collaboration. So, what do you think are needed for collaboration across institutions, if I can call them like that? Communication is key from my perspective, and I think um, I think that uh, that's one of the key reasons why our partnership has strengthened in regards to um, your enthusiasm for actually wanting to get involved and getting more members of staff involved. Um, I think communication has definitely been a key part of our partnership and our collaborative process into how this has come on further than Scots as what it were, yeah. as what it was. Um, 
So for me, communication has been key and also accessibility. So, so again, obviously you mentioned about the digital side of it. We actually took on the students' feedback in regards to how they wanted to take part in this training. And I believe it was, was it a, a couple of hours of training that you delivered? Yes. Um, we changed the training, we changed the governance arrangements, all sorts of things, yeah. which we wouldn't normally do with student union. And I can say I can't yeah. really. Wouldn't normally go that far to do that, but I think that we've taken the collaboration quite a long way. Yeah. No, so, so we've actually um, taken on board that uh, the, the, the students' feedback in regards to making it more accessible for them, ultimately, hopefully, enticing them to be a bit more involved. So they actually um, take part in um, some online training, which is only about should only take about 20 to 25 minutes of their time with a short with a short quiz at the end, and then they also then have that extra training with yourself before they actually take part in a consultancy. So, so, the, so they've got that face-to-face -face contact as well. So they've got that added support from the SU and from and from Jasper as well. Lovely. Thanks for I really hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so if you are interested at all, I'm just going to leave these at the front desk if that's okay. Um, if you are interested at all in, in the programme, um, my email address um, is on there as well, so feel free to drop me any questions because um, we, we have actually a, a, a huge bank of students who are willing to get involved um, and are, are all trained up and ready to go. So if you um, if yourselves or if you know a member of staff who'd like to be involved, feel free to let me know. Okay, Great, thank, thank you, you Jasper. Lovely. Lovely to meet okay. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right. Well, um, so my name is Jasper Schultz. I'm principal lecturer, and I'm here to talk to you about collaboration in the flipped classroom. Um, this is collaboration, my collaboration with the digital education team, um, whom I've worked with a lot over the last few years. Um, and what what I want to do is to really think about um, how we might design, use um, digital tools to make pedagogy more transparent in the flipped classroom. So I've put um, a little word cloud summary of, of some of the tools that are going to be featured one way or another in this presentation below there. Um, but I've picked out five different features for you um, to see what you think. Um, first, a little bit of background about me. I'm principal lecturer in the School of Health and Social Care. Um, I'm currently working towards principal fellowship, higher education academy. So I've put a couple of references to the framework in places. Um, and I'm working um, with the Student Engagement Partnership, um, a national steering group, and with JISC, um, both as an expert panel member and also um, as a member of the co-design team. I'm currently working with the Student Digital Tracker, and I'm really pleased that our institution is working with um, Digital Leadership Programme at the moment, thanks to Andy Began here. Um, to help take our digital leads further forward with us because we all of course need to work with the technology as technology is changing very fast but there's some really exciting things that are coming out of JISC um, masses of wisdom across the sector um, and I've tried to distill some of that into this presentation um, but if it gets lost in translation what I'm going to do is ask digital education if I can put up a blog site and put a lot more um, documents into it um, because there's some really good things within it. Um, what is the flipped classroom? Well, um, I would um, favour the definition of EduCourse, which is a pedagogical module which where the typical lecture and homework elements of the course are reversed. Or in other words, you, you're getting students to do a lot more online before class. Um, and during class, what you can usually do is to shrink or remove completely the, the main lecture or, and followed by the seminar kind of format and use other forms of group work and collaborative inquiry with students um, and ge usually generate much more active learning forms uh, as you do that. Um, often um, working with real case scenarios, um, quite often getting students to create, develop, shape those case scenarios. Sometimes getting students to work across different year groups or even across different disciplines to do that. Um, in more exciting ways. Um, my pedagogy is very much a participatory pe pedagogy, um, which is why I'm going to talk, hopefully not too long, um, about creating films to use in teaching, because I find that mode of, for collaboration and communication very powerful and very useful. Um, but another key feature of my approach would be to make things very visual. Um, and that would include the online learning environment, whether it's Blackboard or website or anything else, but to really give the students um, and other teachers lots of visual markers, where to start, where to finish, and how to progress in their learning. 
and particularly how to connect what they might be doing online with what they do in class. And I'm going to demonstrate to you um, one or two digital tools that help students and teachers connect online learner behaviour, which we might not know much about, with what we might see in the classroom a little bit more. Um, what I'm interested in is developing that design of uh, um, for learning online and in class, class it's obviously it's a blended learning design and it does involve quite a lot of co-production um, tends to involve teachers working together so team teaching um, as Siobhan will know digital developers are regularly hoiked into the, the flipped classroom um, subject librarians too um, and I'm sure I could go on and on with lots of different ideas but my vision would be that we're gradually in including more um, people to teach and support learning um, through this kind of approach um, and a, a recent publication that's been issued the learning wheel model for digital pedagogy um, by Kelsey and Taylor summarizes much of what I've just said really in terms of four key themes of collaboration learning content assessment and communication um, so what I thought I'd do to, to rather than just get sort of giving you lots of different examples I thought I'd probably shape them around five different areas um, five themes going, um, all which are really aiming to make the pedagogy, the intent, more transparent. So we're not wanting to start with the technology because that's not going to get us very far and it could confuse us all. We want to start with the pedagogy, but how can we make our intentions clear in terms of what the pedagogy is, what the teaching challenges might be, um, what the learner needs might be, what the context of learning might be. Um, so these are five different themes that I'm going to look at. Creating films, the first one, personalising learning environments. Um, many of you will know that the word personalising is coming up more and more in higher education. Um, being interdisciplinary, and we had an example at the very beginning around student consultants. Um, and then um, managing the digital gaps. Um, managing digital gaps that might be between one student and the next student. Managing digital gaps that might be between um, us as teachers and, and the learners that we're teaching. Um, and then finally, collaboration across the sector, working beyond the, the institution um, to, to bring in more learning. So let me start with the, um, the first habit, um, which is around creation of films. Um, what I've found through trial and error is that a short film of well under 10 minutes, usually six or seven minutes, can be an excellent way to introduce students to key concepts within module delivery. Um, it can be used also as a very effective way to give students a good assessment brief. Um, you could podcast an assessment brief and that film could be conducted by um, a, a team of markers and that would help with communication and consistency across the marking team just in the process of doing that and it could be placed on Blackboard or another online environment at the beginning uh, as the module begins and then at the suitable moment you can have your in-class assessment brief as well and it will go better because the students will be more prepared and and if your if your assessment event happens to be a, a interview or a group presentation then you could format your film in that in that particular format of an interview or as a group presentation to, to model or demonstrate some of those skills um, second thing about films creating a short film would be to um, make sure that where it's embedded in the blackboard environment is the right place and that it, it sits alongside the other assessment tool. So with staff in my school, I would usually say to them, please don't put your assessment podcast in the wrong place on blackboard and have assessment advice somewhere else. Put it together in one place so that students can see the context for the assessment event. It might be more than one um, assessment event per module anyway. Um, also on the Blackboard environment, put an instruction, as I'm sure most of you will do, on Blackboard what you're asking students to do with the film. Are you asking them just to watch it or watch it and take notes or watch it and um, formulate a question and then connect it with what they're going to do next in the classroom in terms of where they need to take that information or what the next step might be. Th those kind of tools. Um, Google Form is a form that I've used many times now. Um, for student engagement um, training um, and, and that where it worked as effectively as in the classroom situation, Google Form could be used as a revision tool. If you're getting students ready for an in-class test, you can design your Google Form as an in-class test 
um, if it's going to be multiple choice, you can have some multiple choice. If it's going to be free flow, you can have some free flow. But you can get the students to do that online, either in class or before class, and then Google Form will collect the results for you, so I'll show you in a minute. Um, there's lots of different film formats that I've used in, in teaching, sometimes interviewing staff, heads of schools, um, external speakers, um, conference presenters, students, recent alumni, um, practitioners. Um, sometimes I ask students to do it as a talking head um, to camera, talking to other students. And that works particularly well when you're talking about international students, maybe sharing experience with new international students that might be coming through on a programme. But there are many, many different ways um, to, to think about this. Um, I've used Panopto to do some of this. Um, sometimes I use my own film equipment to do that. Um, there's different ways. Um, but as Bergman and Sams point out, um, maybe I should have gone too long about um, creating short films to use in teaching because videos, um, they argue, should be used as the entry point for flipped learning, not the be all and end all, not the, not the most important point. Um, so it could certainly frame some of the teaching, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to encapsulate um, a huge amount of it. And secondly, of course, um, if you keep your film to 10 minutes, you might find yourself making more than one film, and then you might think about how you put those in the sequence and how that relates to the learning outcomes, um, the, the different um, skills, values, um, competences that you might be wanting to develop or areas of professional development that might be relevant to, to what you're teaching. So um, I will quite often on a module delivery have three or four or more films um, populating a, a Blackboard site. Second habit would be one a habit around personalising. Uh, I tried to originally on the slide to pack in loads of information onto the slide and I took it all out again and just put it onto a bit of a diagram. Um, which starts at the top really with communicating the competence that's, that's expected. Um, because when I meet with the other um, digital leads across the um, sector in further and higher education, what we're frequently talking about is um, how to gather, um, do surveys and to gather student digital experience, but to do so in ways where students are more informed about what we're requiring of them. It's no good asking students how digitally confident they might feel or be um, unless we've given them some context and some information about the competences that we would expect for their level of study um, and, um, and in, within the particular discipline area. So of course, area of computer science might look rather different from my own in health and social care. Um, so, so there's something about the expectations that, that needs to be communicated at the same time as information is gathered from students um, and that would really be starting, starting the journey. Um, but the second stage of the journey would be really something around tailoring the online survey. So we have a lot of surveys running, so you probably don't want to do more surveys. Um, so how could I persuade you to, as teachers to do even more surveys with students? Well, the thing I would say is um, a tailored online survey that you do in your classroom is going to help you to understand the learner group in front of you that much better than you and um, I did one recently with a group of 65 students and the learning styles were completely different from what the program leader had expected and she didn't interview all of them two months previously um, but the digital survey um, gave very interesting very different kind of information and it helps you to build up a learner group profile um, because bear in mind for those of us that have maybe taught the same module and programme for many years, student groups coming through are going to change every year, aren't they? Um, so the, the, on, the digital survey can be um, something that you might spend five or ten minutes, um, but that might be a really useful thing to do. Um, the third point down is um, the, the point of doing tailored online surveys in class with students. An uh, online survey that's done in class would, of course, yield different information from that done online elsewhere. If you do it in class, um, what I would do um, is I would be observing and noting the student digital behaviours while it was all going on. So you'll see a range of students' speeds of access to Blackboard, um, getting through the survey. Students will ask you questions as they're doing it. And it tends to generate a lot, lot more information to give you an idea of the range of digital agility. That you might have within a group. 
Um, through that session, um, through individual emails, um, through other classroom activities, through tutorials, questions that get generated from the same learner group um, can be collated. And, and I quite often use a Q&A approach on Blackboard to pull together some of the, the, the queries that come up. Um, and that again sort of makes it much easier to, to work more consistently around digital capability with other teaching staff, I find. Um, another element of personalising learning environments for me would be um, how we could increase learner self-efficacy. Um, so it's really, I suppose, thinking about how you build up your activities, your online activities you're asking students to do, so that they're becoming more confident in what they're doing. Uh, perhaps you're informing them um, as you're doing that as well. Um, and then an, the next step around personalising would be really noting which students are excelling and the strategies that work really well in the flipped classroom. And I did this last year, I, I worked with a group of students and um, students that got particularly good, strong outcomes in the flipped classroom, over 70% in assessment tasks. I went back to them all to talk to them about their experience and their strategies. And then I shared it with a group the following year. And that was quite revealing. Some of it was very obvious, would be very obvious to you in terms of students taking part in all the activities. Other things were a bit less obvious in terms of students in the flipped classroom really need to understand the, the relationship between what you're asked to do online with what they're asked to do in class and how it contributes to the assessment task. So if you align those three elements up really well, really transparently, um, students say that they, they will find it easier to succeed. Um, so that's led me to, to increase the amount of visual markers I place in it. Um, and successful strategies can be shared by students at the end of, of delivery as well. So um, last week we had a group of students, nursing students, that were doing clinical supervision. And for the first time we brought them back in off placement into the classroom to do some group supervision. And then I interviewed a group of them and filmed it and got them to reflect on you know, how the experience went for them. And then that film can be shared with the first year students coming through to tell them about what clinical supervision all about. So sort of, it's really sort of the peer learning that, that can be fl flowed through that. So th those are a few ways to do it. I mean, through the GISC ex expert panel group, um, what we're trying to do um, with the Student Digital Tracker project, which is gathering student digital experience at the moment, is really giving students more ways to answer the question, how well am I doing? So the student survey I mentioned, um, that conducted online in class, um, was um, with a group of new health and social care students um, at the beginning of the first term. And it's really just to give them the experience of some new teaching methods and to see what their experience of it was. Um, what I'd worked out from earlier flipped learner experience was that um, some of the quietest learners in a group don't necessarily enjoy a flipped classroom at all. Um, especially if it's based too much on group work. Um, it can be, a lot of the literature talks about group work as the main mechanism. Um, so with this teacher group, I adjusted the style a bit and I used interactive posts that students could work with either in groups or individually one-to-one -to, -one to add comments so that we could get around that. And, and that did seem to help. Um, what I discovered through that group was that we had a large and proportion of physical learners in the group, and unbeknownst to me. So I made, as part of the activity, I copied an exercise we did at a GIST conference of showcase and presentations, which would be rather than having giving a presentation to 100 people, um, you give it 10 times 10 people, and you keep moving people around, 10 different presentations. And I used that approach here, and it worked really well. And the physical movement got much better levels of engagement from students and keeping them all in one physical space. Another collaborative tool I've used, um, and this was a very basic um, use of the Padlet, um, which is saying to Dan Daniel, um, obviously Padlet's now transformed beyond all recognition because I don't know about you, but I've just done some tutoring training recently where Padlet was used by Ben Edwards very dynamically in a very layered, structured kind of way, taking us through a sequence of tasks where we, did, where we reported back and shared information to each stage. So this was just a really basic effort 
Um, but I think I'm probably going to use a Padlet to um, embed some learning objects around this presentation for you if you're interested, because Padlet's changed beyond all recognition now, so you can embed films and um, all sorts of other good stuff and um, in, in a really interesting visual sequence. Um, so, that, so that's another way. But it does, again, like the Google Form, it allows for a, mo a lot more democracy um, in learning. So some of your quieter learners can um, input to, to Padlins or Mentimeters or Google Forms or Poll Everywhere, whatever you're using, and will do so more fluently and easily um, than when they're having to own their, their comments um, in other ways. Another um, digital tool which I particularly um, enjoy as well, again, is for me, it's got that sort of democratic, participatory feel to it, is the, the word clouds. Um, and many times I'll interrupt a session and just gather feedback from groups and then throw it back out as a word cloud for everyone to look at. And what's rather nice about the word cloud is, of course, the, the number of people that come up with a similar word will make that word bigger on the presentation. So when I ask students around, um, th the potential benefits of the flipped classroom for them. Um, the words consolidating learning, information being more accessible, um, sort of stood out really from, from all the other ones and has sort of helped me guide me really with some of the blended learning designs I've used mm -hmm. since then. But another use of word cloud is that you can do an activity with the students at the beginning and at the end of module delivery and then compare the results in between. Or um, if, like me, you're teaching social science and you're working with lots of international groups of students around common issues such as, let's say, children's disability, I've um, conducted an interview with, with, with a mother, with a parent with a child with a disability and then got the students to reflect on the skills and values required. One group, and I've done it again with a completely different group, and I've got the groups to compare the results and look for similarities and dis differences. So again, it's a very visual way of summarising some key key things, um, but it but it can be useful um, for for bringing that back. So enough about habit two. Habit three, um, and this is really my passion, which is why I wanted Amy to come at the beginning, which is really being interdisciplinary. Um, in a lot of the literature around digital education and those occasions where the digital is enhancing the teaching and learning, um, it's often because it's forging um, collaboration um, beyond the discipline. It's rather sort of the board, it's right, we're moving into a borderless teaching scenario or rhizomatic learning scenario because in fact, if we stay contained with our disciplines, we're going to miss so many collaborative opportunities to learn from our partners. And naturally, across the university, we, we do this a lot, don't we? We talk to each other and we, we share practice. And of course, the digital tools can really accelerate um, some of these processes. And um, whether that's collaborating with other staff in other disciplines or whether it's collaborating with students across other disciplines. And I've given a lot of national um, conference papers in the last couple of years, and I will always gain people's attention when I talk about the Student Consultants project um, because it is so unusual um, and it's so dynamic in terms of this process of learning more about the student experience. If you want to learn more about the student digital experience, the blended learning, the flipped classroom experience, if you've introduced a new um, tool or approach in your teaching, um, then it gives you an opportunity to gain feedback from students outside the discipline as well as those within it. And I've demonstrated on a number of occasions through different projects that you can get different feedback from a student that's not within your discipline, who you're not going to be assessing or marking their work later on. Um, and that can be really useful um, to do that. So habit four, um, the digital gap. Um, how capable and how competent are we as teachers to deliver against the flip to learn expectations that we might have before us? Um, I said at the beginning it was really important to give students information about what we expect of students, but I suppose that's a two-way street, isn't it? What do students expect of us digitally? Are we as ready for, for, for what they're wanting? Um, and with, with the Student Digital Tracker um, project, which what started the pilot last year and is now rolled out and I think we've got up to 19,000 
completed um, entries at this point in time and there's a couple more months to go so it's going to be a, a, gather a lot of summative data to demonstrate student digital experience and also to demonstrate what's going on within institutions in terms of teaching <coughs> practice and um, organisational capability as well and what we can already see from the, the, the original tracker project is that there's quite a gap between the abilities of teachers and learners in, in many different places. And as you all know, lots of digital gaps across disciplines as well within schools and um, colleges. Um, so whenever we're collaborating with our colleagues, uh, we might at any point hit some of these digital gaps um, and, and need to think about how we manage that. Um, so I suppose um, in this next slide, in terms of building digital capability, um, we've got some tools, infrastructure and systems already in place to help us understand more about the student digital experience um, through things such as the Get Set data that we get students to do to give us information about new students starting. Um, we get it through the NSS, we get it through the PTS, um, but we, we've also got other um, projects and I think James has got one running at the very moment isn't he or it's just about to finish um, which is looking at how st students like to access information online about the university and about the studies all things related to their academic experience so that's going to give us more no doubt I'm sure if we asked Andy could could um, give us a lot more examples as well about what, what's going on to gather the, the student digital experience uh, but on the staff side, again, we've got some data there as well in terms of we, we've been using the GIST capa digital capability framework and the discovery tool um, to gather some information about staff digital capability. And we've got Blackboard standards, but um, I'm sure we've got many other opportunities um, that will come through the digital leadership program to think more about um, staff digital readiness. Um, because uh, as the technologies um, develop, there are lots of opportunities here, um, but we might need to do a lot more. And then finally, the last habit I want to explore with you, um, which is really around, uh, which is what I'm doing at the moment around my application for principal fellowship, is really collaboration beyond the institution um, and a few ideas of why it, it can really benefit um, digital practice and digital leadership. Um, what I've been doing in the last few years is working with other institutions, um, Sheffield University, around um, student engagement and student development. And we've been using a lot of digital tools to connect because um, helping Sheffield to write their policies and um, look at different aspects of practice can be done very easy on a Google Doc where 10 or 20 or 30 different staff could contribute to the document and it doesn't have to be within an institutional framework to do that. Um, we don't have many opportunities to meet up face to face but we'll do that through conferences so I've recruited some colleagues from another university a, a previous conference delivery and then we're going back to do a joint paper at a subsequent one and we're running a project in between so there's a lot of learning there because um, I can learn from the way that they're using the digital tools and their different learning and platforms from, from our own to do that. Um, so, so that's really useful. Um, the, other, the other real advantage, the other real um, gain of um, working beyond one's institution is really just learning obviously from other institutions and places. So a lot of the work I've been doing with the Jessica as a student expert panel member has been to bring back some of the tools and methods that we've been using into my own teaching and staff development as well. Um, and I'm going to write a few examples of that and put them up on the, the blog site later in, in case anybody's interested. Um, and for, for principal fellowship, the level that I'm looking at, um, strategic leadership examples is really important. So it's really useful to have some opportunities to demonstrate impact um, beyond one's own institution in these kind of ways, as well as what can be learned from it. So going back to the GIST showcase, that idea of breaking down the delivery rather than presenting or lecturing to a large group, thinking about giving the information to the student groups in a different way. Um, 
This is an activity which I adapted from the GIST showcase presentation um, around the room activity. And I've got some handouts here if anybody would like one, um, just to, to write up the model um, to see how it applies. Um, so what you can do with it is with um, um, a large group of students, you can split them into five smaller groups and then get them each, each working on an activity. The activity could be on the poster, uh, the information, the case scenario, the, the suggestion of what students need to do. The activity could be on a table, doesn't really matter. You could, you could do it in any, any which way. But the basic is to reduce the number of students that are on the group and then that could be run as a collaborative exercise. So it could be a student-led activity or you could have staff post the different activities or the sum of the activities. And then what you do is you give them an activity to do within six minutes and then get everybody to move clockwise one activity every six minutes. Um, and then you can do that until all the activities are completed. Um, what I would do with the, that kind of format is I might have four activities that relate to the learning outcomes, the module content that I want to deliver. And then the fifth activity might be something information I want to get from the student group. So on this, with this, the last time I did this activity, I got the students to do a learning style activity. I got them to pick out their preferred learning style from a list, and I got them all to write a statement about what they're learning, what, what that meant for them. And that, that gave some really interesting and valuable data then as well. Um, so I would call that a dove, dovetailing, really. So, so it's, once you've got the students engaged in meaningful learning, you can add something else to it. Or you could do a student digital survey, or you could do a student other student engagement exercise, what you might want to do. Um, but that's proved um, to be um, very successful. Um, I've done this as well at, at student conferences <coughs> as well. I've flipped the conference and given the information and got students to contribute posters and films for a conference. And then we've done the roundtable activity in the uh, conference as well. And we've got students to facilitate each of the activities. Um, or if you wanted to be really ambitious, you could get year two students to facilitate it with year ones as well. So there's many different ways to, to try that. Um, another aspect of the collaboration, the digital collaboration, would be around the scholarly practice um, and thinking about ways of connecting and reaching those wider audiences. Um, and um, having gone to the trouble of collecting together some of my, my better practice around student engagement and put it on the blog site. I was really pleased to see within a very short space of time it had got over three and a half thousand hits, um, which is, isn't something I'm used to experiencing when you share practice. To get So the digital, some, using the LALT website has been an effective um, way of disseminating sharing for me practice with colleagues beyond the university as well as those within it. Um, and um, similar things happened to me as well with the using the writing blog articles, the HEA as well, in terms of sort of getting the message out there further. And th these are incredibly useful tools for those of us that want to, to develop practice and, and work towards senior and principal fellowship. Um, but they also do make the pedagogy that much more transparent as well. So rather than me giving this presentation and then going away again, um, it can be more sequential than that, rather like the, the blended learning environments I was talking on later on, you can give a presentation and then there could be follow-up um, resources um, that could surround that. So thematically, um, that, that becomes much more of a sort of clustered entity. And th there are some references at the end. And there I shall stop. <laughs>